Heavenly Father, thank you for these moments together. Thank you for taking us on a journey. We want to be smarter. We want to be better. We do not want to come and invest time in a moment without being changed in the midst of it. So today, through the Word of God, the Spirit of God, minister to us, change us, help us to be more like Jesus than ever before. That is our passionate prayer in the mighty and precious name of Jesus. And we all agree together saying, Amen. Amen. You know, right now in our society, uh, it, the volatility level is just so, so great. It's like someone went in the back room, found the dial back there that said emotions and put it on the highest possible area, and they just turned it up, and the volatility is just there. In fact, if we're honest, we recognize that most people are one thing away from stepping over the edge. They're just one thing away from stepping over the edge, and all of a sudden, they're going to be on the news, and people are going to say, we knew them. They're totally normal. How in the world could they have done this? And it's all because of the volatility. Now, all I've ever done as pastor, for 48 years, I've, I've pastored, and as I said yesterday, I'm with people when they're on top of the mountain, and I'm with people when the mountain's on top of them. That's what I've done for a living. But this uh, last year, there came out a study that just astounded me as a pastor, but it was something that we saw in our congregation, and it said this. It said, Gen Z, and for those of you that aren't up on the generations and how they break up, Gen Z is the age ages 11 to 26, 11 to 26, Gen Z, they say right now, 60% of them have been diagnosed with anxiety disorder. It's never been that way in the history of any generation. My generation, some of you would be in that. Some of you are in a different generation, Jabin's uh, generation. Uh, You've never had more than 20% of people But why did that happen? It happened because there was this thing called COVID that happened, and and in the midst of it, we began to look at these young kids, and we began to say to them, hey, you've got to go to your room, you've got to stare at this screen, and if you come out of this room and you quit staring at this screen, then you might kill somebody, or someone might kill you because this thing is so contagious, and then it went on, and it went on, and then finally, someone decided it was over, and we said, now, go into the world and be normal. And they didn't know how to do it. What I'd like to tell you is it's only that generation, but, but in my church, I have dozens of people in their 70s that we've not been able to get back to church. The way we pastor them now is that they stand on their front porch, we stand on their sidewalk, and we carry on a conversation. Because in their minds, if they leave their house, something will happen. See, one of the things that you have to understand is that emotions will drive you or they will guide you. Emotions will drive you or they will guide you. They will drive you places that you shouldn't go and they will keep you there longer than you should stay or they can guide you and be stepping stones in your life to where God wants you to go. But the truth of the matter is, is right now in our society, more people are being driven by emotions than guided by emotions. Emotions are a part of our world. Paul said, we rejoice with those that rejoice and we weep with those that weep. We are going to navigate the extremes, the happy days, the sad days, but the problem is, is when one day becomes your only emotion. And so emotions can guide you or they can drive you. And what I want to do is I want to look at four emotions that someone in the Bible faced and how these emotions began to come into their life and how they had to overcome them. And these emotions are vividly displayed in Matthew chapter 26 in the life of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, those of you that know a little bit of the background of the Bible, what you know is this. 
this is that you know Jesus is about to go to the cross. He's about to become the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. But right now, he has begun to conclude his ministry, three and a half years of extensive ministry, and he's beginning to feel the weight. Some of you, when you live your life, you say, I feel like the weight of the world is on me. But the truth of the matter is, is the weight of the world has only been on one person. And, and that is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But can you imagine that you're about to take a journey and you realize you're going to carry the weight of of the world. You're going to carry every sin of the past, every sin of the present, and every sin of the future. You're going to carry it. That sin is going to be on you, and if you don't carry it, no one else can. And so because he's feeling the weight of that, he faces the first emotion, and that emotion is loneliness. See, when you're carrying something that no one else is carrying, you feel like I'm all alone. No one understands. No one gets it. No one can appreciate it. No one really knows what I'm feeling. No one knows what I'm facing. No one knows what I'm going through. No one. And see, some of you, you carry weight. It's not the weight of the world. It may be the weight of your family. And you felt that weight and you said, man, no one gets it. No one gets me. No one understands me. No one can really appreciate what I'm feeling right now. The context of who I am, no one really can get it. That's what Jesus was feeling. Our Surgeon General of the United States, he recently came out and he made this statement. He said, the greatest epidemic that we're having in the United States today is the epidemic of loneliness. And then he made this statement. He said, profound loneliness has the same physical effect on your body as smoking 12 cigarettes a day. Wow. Now imagine that. He's saying that loneliness, if it's not put in its box, it will affect you like 12 cigarettes a day. I've never smoked in my life. Some of you are professional at it, but I never have. <laughs> but it says, if I get myself in a lonely state and I live there and I stay there, it has the 12, it has the effect of 12 cigarettes. But here's another thing. Other studies have shown that loneliness, that when you're lonely, you're 38 times more likely to die of every disease. Wow. See, that's why in the Bible, God started off and he said, it's not good that people be alone. It was never the anticipation. And so, 38 times, if I were to say at my back table, there's a pill that we can sell you that will reduce your likelihood of heart disease, cancer, emphysema, diabetes, people would line up to go buy that to take it. But if I just said, hey, you need to be a part of a community, and being a part of a community is a life-changing moment for you, people don't always get it. But see, here's the thing that you need to understand is that loneliness can get you. Jesus was feeling the loneliness because he's about to climb up a hill he doesn't have to climb up, and he's about to carry a cross he doesn't have to carry, and he's about to uh, be nailed on that cross when he doesn't have to be nailed on it. He's going to die on that cross when he doesn't have to die on it, and he's going to be put in a grave that he doesn't have to be put in, and all of that is for you and me, but he's carrying the weight of the world, and some of you have felt weight in your shoulders, and it made you feel all alone, but just magnify that to the greatest extent and imagine what our Lord and Savior was feeling. He was feeling lonely. So the thing that he did was he got his posse together, that group of people that he felt were his best. And he says, guys, he says, can you go out with me and can you pray with me? And as he began to ask them to go out, he's going to face a second emotion because he said, you know, I'm carrying something and you can't relate to it. And there are times when, when what we're carrying, no one else can relate to it. And we know that, but we just want a little bit of help. We don't want them to carry it for us. We just, hey, could you just give me a little bitty break here? Because if you give me a little bitty break, I'll just be able to breathe one breath without feeling exhausted. Just give me that one minute. And so he looked at him and he said, could you just pray for one hour? And then he went off and, and he was praying and he came back 
and they were asleep. They hadn't prayed. And he's going to feel the second emotion. And the second emotion is disappointment. Disappointment in people that are around you. Disappointment in people that you care about. Disappointment because you haven't asked them to do everything for you. You just ask them to do just one little thing. Just one little thing. Could you just do this? And so as he's heading towards the cross, he faces this emotion of loneliness. I'm carrying something no one can relate to. But now he feels the disappointment of the team around him that he had raised up. He said, man, I'm not asking you to pray 24 hours. I'm just asking for one hour. But the disappointment of knowing that the smallest level of commitment was just sort of, they couldn't do it at that point. And can you imagine what it was like? Because when he was out there praying, it said he was sweating, but he wasn't perspiring like us. He was perspiring blood because of the intensity of what he was feeling. So now he feels lonely. And not only does he feel lonely, but he feels disappointed. But now another emotion's gonna come at him because here he is isolated. He's out there with just a few people, but there's going to be a large group of people that are going to begin to come. And this large group of people that are going to begin to come, there's going to be one man who steps out and he's going to come over to him. He's going to kiss him. And we know who that one man is. His name's Judas. But you have to put it in Jesus' perspective. Jesus, for three and a half years, had poured his heart into Judas. For three and a half years, he had given him his very best. He had given him everything that he needed. He had provided for him. He had loved him. He had cared for him. But he's going to experience that third emotion, which is called hurt. When you've invested in people and they look at you and say, it didn't matter. It just doesn't matter. And see, all of us at times have given our best to someone and then they do something and it's like, It wasn't important what you did for me. And we feel the weight of that because we feel the hurt. We gave our best and they look at our best and they just shake it off. See, our Lord and Savior, as he was heading towards the cross, he felt alone. He not only felt alone, he felt disappointed. He not only felt disappointed, but he felt hurt. And so he's facing these emotions. But then... As he's arrested, the next morning, there's going to be another emotion he's going to feel. And that emotion that he's going to feel is because he's going to be put before a group of people. And it's because Pilate can't find anything wrong. He's going to try to figure out a way out of what's about to happen. And he puts a known thief up and he puts Jesus up and he says to the crowd, he says, guys, I'll let one of these two go. You just holler out. Do you want the thief? You know that this is a thief. You know this is a criminal over here. Or do you want Jesus? But one of them's going to be let go. One of them's going to be crucified. Which one? And they began to holler that they wanted Barabbas to be let go. Can you imagine the rejection that Jesus felt? See, all those people that were yelling, crucify him, were the people he was going to be crucified for. He was going to walk up a hill for him. He was going to hang on a cross for him. He was going to die for him. And, And they're looking at him and they're saying, hey, we don't care. See, if you look at what is happening is something more than just a historical event. Jesus is faced with a choice. Am I going to let my emotions drive me? Because if they drive me, I will not do the very thing I was put here on this planet to do. Or I can be guided by God in the midst of overwhelming emotions. So the emotions are just overwhelming him right now. He's feeling this loneliness no one can relate. He's feeling this disappointment as key team members cannot do the smallest thing. He's feeling the hurt of having someone that he invested his life in. And then he's feeling rejection of the very people that he had come to give his life for. And he's feeling all of that. 
So my question to you is, when emotions try to overwhelm you, what do you do to get through them? So that you don't miss what God puts you here for. So, so what is it that you do? I mean, these emotions, I can't even imagine, you know, just think of what heaven's going to be like because we're going to get to watch the reruns, but they won't be on Netflix. And we're going to sit there and see, and I want to see, I want to see this moment as Jesus is heading towards the cross, but every emotion in him is saying, don't do it, don't do it, don't do it. And he's at his emotional worst, and yet he's going to accomplish the will of God. So here's the premise. When you're at your emotional worst, can you still accomplish the will of God? So here's here's what you need to recognize. Jesus did three things that got him through his emotions. There were three things that Jesus is going to do. And those three things are the same three things I have to do and you have to do when emotions are coming at us and compressing us and and beginning to push us and drive us places. The first thing is pretty obvious because it's the very reason Jesus went out there. And that is, number one, your prayers have to be bigger than your feelings. Your prayers have to be bigger than your feelings. Now, I know people are stumbling in here today, and this is sort of your first entry point into church, and, and, and you hear that prayer thing. Well, you know, that's just that church thing. They're always going to say pray. They're just always going to mention prayer. They're always going to say prayer. But see, I need you to know something. Jesus, at his most vulnerable moment, when emotions were pushing him and driving him and overwhelming him, his first response was to pray. And what I want to say to you is if the perfect, sinless son of God had to pray to get him through his emotions, then I'm going to have to pray to get me through my emotions. But your prayers have to be bigger than your feelings. See, people say, well, what does prayer do? First of all, it creates perspective. It reminds you that there is a God and you're not him. And for some people, that's a revelation. Because some people act like they're God. But there is a God, and it's not you. And every time you pray, what you're saying is, no matter what's happening here, you're still there. No matter what's going on here, you're still on the throne up there. And so you begin to understand the vastness of who God is. But your prayers have to be bigger than your feelings. Now, I'm a pastor. It's all I've ever done. And so at the end of my services, here's what happens in my church. We have a center aisle. It would go back further than that back wall. When it's all done, I walk out, I stand at the back door, and I greet people. But what you know as a pastor is is eventually you see patterns of behavior. Because some people, I've done church, hey, pastor, I'm going to eat. They're on a mission. And it's not to talk to me. They're going somewhere. Hey, we did the church thing. We're moving on. Hey, good seeing you. Hope to see you in a little bit. But we're going to eat. And they're going. But what you notice is there's a few people, they'll talk to you every time they see you. They'll talk to you every time. And there's nothing wrong with that. But I had this guy in my church. Every time he was at church, and you've got to understand, the average person comes to church once every three weeks. And so about every three weeks, I'd be at the back door. And he would come up to me, and he would tell me this story. He said, Pastor, I need to tell you what I'm going through. He would tell me this story. Three weeks later, he'd tell me this story what I'm going through. And then three weeks later, he'd tell me the story of going through. And I kept hearing this. And, and I looked at him about the fourth time. And I said, I just need to ask you a question. Do you talk to God as much as you talk to me about your problem? I, I want to say that slowly for some of you. I said, do you talk to God as much as you talk to me about your problem? And, and he seemed stunned. He said, but, but you're my pastor. I said, but I'm not your God. 
And I said, I'm glad that you're talking to me, but you understand the best that I can give you is, I'm so sorry. I'm sorry you're going through that. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry you're faced with, that's the best I got. I wished I had a better game than that. I wished I had better skills that I could change your life, make your life good, make your life perfect, but the best I had. And I just said, why would you spend all your time talking to somebody who the best that they can do is say, I'm sorry, when you could spend that same amount of time talking to God who can change your life? So the question is, do you talk to people more than you talk to God? Aren't there some people that every time you hear them, you're going to hear the same thing? Yeah, you don't point at them. But I mean, it's going to be the same thing. I mean, you know, it's the same playlist. You know, I'm going through this. You know, when I was divorced, well, when this happened. And none of that's wrong as long as your prayer life is bigger. So your prayers have to be bigger than your feelings. You've got to pray, and you've got to make your prayers bigger than your feelings, because if you don't, your feelings will take you down a road. And so you have to begin to pray, and and you have to begin to believe God, and you have to begin to do that. But the second thing Jesus did was his love for God was greater than his feelings. His love for God. Because what we know is every time Jesus prayed, he said, God, nevertheless. He said, God, I love you so much. Nevertheless. Just nevertheless. Let me tell you something about everyone in this room, and I know no one in this room other than Jabin. But everyone in this room has something to be mad at, and everyone in this room has something to be sad at. Everyone does. Everyone. Man, if you knew what I've been through, if you knew the heartbreak that I felt, everyone. Let me tell you another secret. No one in this room thinks what you're mad at and sad at is better than what they're mad at and sad at. (laughs) But everyone in here, aren't there people you wouldn't recognize them if they weren't mad? I mean, because it's it's all it's all they've ever been. Every time you see them, they're just mad. They're mad. They're mad. They're mad. And if they quit being mad, they wouldn't have a personality. I mean, because you've always known them mad, and it was never a question of whether they were going to be mad. It was just, what are they going to be mad at? Who are they going to be mad at? And then there's some people, they're always sad. And if they weren't sad, you, you look like them. I'm, I'm not sure you're them, I, but you look alike. Because you've only known them and their sadness. Yeah, yeah. Your love for God has to be bigger than what you're mad and sad at. Wow. Wow. And right now in our country, we have people who just love being mad yeah. and love being sad yeah. more than they love God. Yeah. Jesus said, You're the Father. Nevertheless, 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 I love you that I'll do this because I love you. I do this because I care for you. And see, when your emotions are pushing you, your prayers have to be bigger than what you feel and your love for God has to be bigger. But a third thing has to be bigger. Your faith has to be bigger than what you feel. Now, when I say your faith has to be bigger than what you feel, 
I need you to understand what I'm talking about. See, there are times when I will preach messages and, and, and they will be the very direct message. You've got to have God in your life. I mean, it is the difference between heaven and hell. It is the difference between living eternity here versus there. And I will teach and I will say, you've got to have. And occasionally, and several years ago, there was a young man who, when I was preaching about this absolute of faith, as I was at that back door, he ran out and he says, you're telling me I have to believe. I said, I'm not telling you. I'm saying that's what God said. Yeah. For God so loved the world that whosoever believeth in him. I said, I didn't say that. I just happened to read it. I was at a hotel in Las Vegas and pulled out my Gideon Bible. And I read it. And it says, whoever believes in him. And he says, well, if I'm going to believe, you've got to answer these questions. And I just looked at him. I said, do you think you're the only person who has questions? I said, I've held the hand. I haven't been, in, you know, gotten the text. I didn't get the email. I've held the hand of 17 people when they took their last breath on this planet. I was in the room. I was holding their hand when you could feel the last beat of blood. You could hear the last breath. 17 times I was in that room holding someone's hand. I said, every one of those times I was believing for a miracle. I said, if I could answer your questions, I'd answer my questions first. But you know what that young man, he didn't understand. Some people think that being a person of faith means you don't have any questions. Being a person of faith doesn't mean that there aren't questions. The reason some of you have never become a person of faith is you've tried to figure out the answer to all the questions. Do you understand when Jesus was praying that prayer, he was saying, God, if there's another way, he was asking a question. If there's something other than me hanging on that cross, dying on that cross, let's go that way. Faith isn't the absence of questions. One of my heroes in the faith has always been Mother Teresa, and Mother Teresa was just this Nobody who did something magnificent, but in doing something magnificent, she created this whole facility of helping hurting people. But one day after she died, what happened was her memoirs came out. And she wrote in there that there were periods of time in her life that she didn't feel God. There were times in her life that she questioned, she's doing greatness, and she said she didn't. And everyone that didn't believe in God said, see, she didn't believe But see, anyone who's a person of faith knows that there's days that you don't feel it. But see, in your life and my life, what we know is this. It's not the absence of questions. It's not having the perfect answer. It's having the perfect God. So what I want to say to you is this. Jesus at his most vulnerable moment when everything was coming at him, he was overwhelmed emotionally. He knew to get through his emotions, his prayers had to be bigger. His love had to be bigger and his faith had to be bigger. There was a man named Dallas Willard. He was the head of uh, philosophy out at the University of Southern California. One of the most brilliant thinkers in Christian faith. But these kids would go off to college and they're taught critical thinking. Let me tell you about critical thinking. It makes you critical. (laughs) Hey, you don't need a four-year school to become critical. Some of us became critical and never went to that kind of school. But these kids many times were people of faith and they would come And they would say, Dallas, 
these professors are making us have all these questions. And Dallas would just look at him and he would say this, why don't you doubt your doubts as much as you doubt your faith? See, some of you, you're just doubting the wrong thing. Faith isn't the absence of questions. It's just the presence of a perfect God. So I pray today that if you're overwhelmed, you'll do what Jesus did. Pray bigger than your feelings. Love bigger than your feelings. And how about this? Believe bigger than your feelings. Every head bowed, every eye closed. This morning, I want to ask three simple questions. The first question is, do you have a relationship with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? Let me tell you what I'm not asking. I'm not asking if you're a member of my church or this church. I'm not asking whether you've been through confirmation. I'm not asking whether you've been through dedication. I'm not asking whether you've been through water baptism or you were christened. I'm asking this, do you know that if the God forbid happened today and you were in an accident and you closed your eyes for the last time on this planet, do you know that when you opened your eyes you would be in heaven with Jesus? If you don't, I wanna pray for you. If you're not certain, I wanna pray for you. But a second question, are you close to him? See, Jesus didn't come into your life to be a part of your life. Jesus came into your life to be the center. And if he's not the center, today's the day. Today's the day. Jesus is an auxiliary part. He's the focal point of your life. And if you know that you're not close to him, even though you believe in him, I want to pray. But if you can say yes to that first one and yes to that second one, there's a third question. Have you ever been filled with the Spirit like it talks about in Acts chapter 2 and verse 4? Because there's two promises in the New Testament. The promise of Jesus, it secures your future. You're going to heaven. The promise of the Holy Spirit gives you power to live for today. You need both of them. So our heads are bowed and eyes are closed, no one looking around. In any one of those three areas, you know I'm talking to you. If you'd like to be a part of this prayer, if you'll raise your hand wherever you're at right now. I see that hand. 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 If you haven't raised your hand up to now and you want to be a part, would you just raise it right now? I see that hand. 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 Last time, if you haven't raised it, please do it now. I see it. I see it. Now, what's going to happen is all of us are going to pray a prayer in this room because church isn't a spectator sport. We're either receiving in faith or we help others receive in faith. So everyone in here is going to pray this prayer. But this prayer is going to be life-changing to the ones that raise their hands. But we're going to help by contributing our faith. So out loud, if everyone will repeat after me, Heavenly Father, you said in Romans chapter 10 that if I believe in my heart, and confess with my mouth that Jesus is Lord, that I would be saved. Today I'm doing that. I believe with all my heart that you are my Lord. Therefore, I thank you for saving me and changing my life forever in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, for doing that today. In Jesus' name, amen.